Okay, so having seen the operation of union, let us next see the operation of intersection. Intersection of two sets. So let us straight away see the definition. Let A and B be any two sets, then their intersection denoted by this notation is defined to be the set of those elements that belong to both the sets A and B. It is the set of the elements common to both A and B. Symbolically, we write the intersection of A and B like this. It is the set of those elements x such that x belongs to A and x belongs to B. And I have also written the uh, this uh, set builder notation for the union so that we can see exactly how they are different from each other. In case of union, if you express that similarly, here you have the logical connective R. There, however, you have and. And unlike the small discussion we had about R, that it's the inclusive R, there is no such uh, mystery about AND. AND is your usual AND. It has the usual meaning. The Venn diagram for the intersection looks like this. Just like before, if your sets A and B are subsets of some large enough set U, then you can take that U as your universal set and always universal sets are denoted, I mean expressed pictorially by drawing a rectangular or square region. Inside that you draw these closed regions, closed uh, bounded by some simple closed curve. The first one represents A, the second one represents B. And the region common to those two regions is what will represent A intersection B. To show that region, um, specifically we are using these parallel lines. So it is this region that is representing A intersection B. And just like we read this notation for union as A cap B, this one is read as A cap B because this symbol looks like a cap. That, one's, that one looks like a cap. Alright, so let us next see some examples that will illustrate intersection. In fact, we are going to take those same sets that we took for illustrating union. So we need to recall those sets. And again, let me repeat that there is no point writing example numbers. You can maintain numbers if you are following the book, the textbook very closely, but uh, the actual understanding is what matters. But anyway, let us take these two sets which we took before also. Let A be the set consisting of these four natural numbers. And B consists of these four natural numbers. Then by the definition A intersection B will consist of the elements that are common to both the sets. And those elements are 6 and 8. That is why A intersection B or A cap B is this set. Now all of these things may seem very easy, they are, but say you are given, let me just tell you a very simple small trick, but it may save some time in some situations. Suppose you are given two finite sets whose intersection you want to find, like this. And the finite sets are written in roster notation, 
where you can see all the elements. How do you do this? Well, it may not be the case that the sets are really this small. The sets may actually have many elements. So what you do, you first take the set that looks small, the smaller one among the two. Of course, that does not mean you have to actually count how many element, elements each one has and then see which one is the smaller. I mean, just from the look of the sets, you will be able to say which one is smaller. So you take the smaller one and then you start picking elements from the smaller one and each element you see whether it belongs to the second set or not. If it belongs to the second set, you put it in the intersection. If it does not, you forget about it. Okay, so because anyway, the intersection has to consist of the elements common to both the sets. So there is no point in starting from the large set, larger set. You always start from the smaller set and then see which one of its elements also belong to the larger set. So that way you can find the intersection. Let us see another one. And in this next example, we are going to go back to that uh, cricket team, hockey team, that thing. So there, uh, I think it was football team, whatever it is, the sets were this. It consisted of some class 11 students. And the set Y had these people. Obviously, you can see that Gita is the only element common to both X and Y. So, in this case, the intersection is this single term set. In this very next example, you have uh, such a situation that I was talking about here. You have again two sets. Let A be the set of all natural numbers less than or equal to 10. Actually, in the textbook, all the numbers have been written, but that is not necessary. As we have already discussed that when you feel that the number of elements has become really large, you can freely use ellipses. And especially if the pattern of the elements is known, is clear, you know that after 1, 2 is coming, after 2, 3 is coming. So that way only the numbers are going to come and they are ending at 10. So there is in fact no real need to write all the numbers. And B consists of these four numbers, 2, 3, 5 and 7, which you look, if you look a little carefully, these are nothing but the prime numbers among all those numbers. Yes. Then, okay, now in order to see what the common elements are, what will you do? Will you start with A? No. A is the larger set. You start with B, you pick each element of B and see whether it belongs to A or not. Two, is 2 there? Yes. 
so it will be in the intersection is 3 there yes and also 5 and 7 are there so that means all the elements of b will be there in the intersection in other words the intersection is nothing but b so a intersection in b in this case is b itself note that here b is a subset of a and this is true in general not just for these two sets in general if c and d are any sets such that C is a subset of D or D is a anything you can take then the intersection is going to be the smaller one the subset okay this is true in general and you can think about it and convince yourself that yes it is true in general for any two sets C and D satisfying this containment relation Let us take another example and this last example will illustrate a special case let A consist of 1 and 2 and B consist of 3 and 4. Well, in this case, there is no element common to A and B, which means that the intersection should be empty. In other words, it is the empty set. Then, A intersection B is the empty set. Now this situation occurs so frequently that it merits a name and accordingly you have a small definition. It is not given as a definition in the text but nevertheless I am uh, treating it as a definition. Let A and B be any two sets such that their intersection is empty then they are called disjoint If you have more than two sets and in, if you pick any two of them and they turn out to be disjoint, then that collection of sets is said to be mutually disjoint or pairwise disjoint. Let me just add that also. If we have a collection of sets will you get scared if I be a little abstract say instead of taking three or four sets I am going to take n sets where n can be any positive integer you need to get used to these things okay say these are my sets a1 a2 and so on a n such that if you pick any two of them and they are disjoint then 
this collection of sets or these sets together are called pairwise disjoint or mutually disjoint. The purpose of these names is that when you encounter such a situation, instead of always writing these things again and again, you can just write those terms, disjoint or mutually disjoint. From that itself you will know uh, what it means or what you are trying to say. Others will know. Such that if you pick any two of them, any two means any two different uh, sets from this collection. So in order to express that I write AI where I can be any number from 1 to n. And another one AJ where j also can be any number from 1 to n but not equal to i, so that they are distinct. And take their intersection and that is empty for any distinct i and j. See, when you write two uh, indices like this and then write equal to that kind of range, it means that each one of them can take any one of these n values. And the word distinct takes into account the fact that i is not equal to j. Then the sets are called mutually disjoint or pairwise disjoint. That is any pair of sets you take from this collection AI and AJ they are going to be disjoint. Any pair. Any pair of distinct set of course that is understood. Let us uh, take an example also of this, this specific situation. Let A1 be the set of 1 comma 2. A2 be the set 3 comma 4 and A3 be the set say 5 comma minus 1 comma 6. Then they are pairwise disjoint because you take any two of them either A1 and A2 or A2 and A3 or A3 and A1 they are disjoint. Okay. Then A1, A2 and A3 are pairwise disjoint. And one more thing, one more final thing about this disjointness. Note that disjointness and distinctness are different notions for sets of course I am talking about two sets being disjoint and two sets being distinct are two entirely different things. 
you take one example suppose a is this thing and b is this thing then a and b are distinct because a is not equal to b distinct means being different but they are not disjoint that's because a intersection b is this okay distinct but not disjoint you can have the other case also disjoint but not distinct in this way the sets empty set and empty set no one is saying that these two sets have to be the same set when you form the intersection of two sets it's not i mean no one is forcing you to take different sets or distinct sets you can take the same set also so the empty set and the empty set are disjoint sets their intersection is empty why is the intersection empty because well there is no elements to begin with so how can there be a common any common element so the intersection remains empty but when the intersection is empty we call the sets disjoint so it is disjoint with itself this is the only set for which this happens but of course they are not distinct because they are the same set not one more thing that the empty set is disjoint with not just itself but actually any set but it is not distinct with itself because they are the same set all right so just like we saw some basic properties of union let us now see some basic properties of intersection and then and the last property actually involves both union as well as intersection so let's see what these properties are they will be almost exactly uh, similar to the ones for union some properties of intersection so if you remember the first property of the operation of union was the commutative law here also for intersection also we have a commutative law we have an associative law those things are there so let us start just like how we started there for union let a b and c be any sets the first property is commutative law the commutative law again here also it says that when you take the intersection of two sets it does not matter in which order you take them a intersection b and b intersection a are actually the same set changing order has no effect on intersection number 2 associative law and like union here also in case of the associative law we do not change order but we change the association i mean how we are going to combine the elements in 
what order we are going to combine the elements. And here, order does not mean arrangement. It means which one of the three you are going to consider first. Uh, I mean, which two of the three, and then you take the intersection of the third one with that one. Here, we have first of all decided to take the intersection of A and B, and then we intersect that set with C. Or you may choose to form this set also, where you do the intersection B intersection C first, and then with that set you intersect A. These two sets are equal. Note that uh, arrangement wise we have not changed the order. First A comes then B then C. Here also A, B and C. After this you have uh, a law which actually is, it really does not have any name but they have given it a name. The law of empty set and universal set. These are standard names, but this third one, this, the name they have given, it's not standard. The law of the empty set and the universal set. Well, it just says that if we take the intersection of any set A with the empty set, then it's the empty set itself. And you can understand why. Is there any element common to A and the empty set? No, because the empty set does not have any element. And that is why the intersection is also empty. And if you take the intersection of the universal set with any set A, then you get A. And this is in fact a consequence of the observation we made a while ago that if we have two sets D and C and one of them is a subset of the other, then the intersection is the subset. In this case, because U is your universal set, so U will be the larger one and A will be a subset. And that is why when you take the intersection, you are going to get the subset. So that is why it comes. And in fact, this is also the reason for this. I mean, you can view this equation uh, like this also. Why? Because the empty set is a subset of every set. And that is why this. Okay, so from that observation itself, we get these things. These things also can be proved. Uh, they have to, however, prove, uh, be proved from scratch. But anyway, let us now see the fourth one, which is your idempotent law. For the idempotent law, you just take the intersection of a set with itself and it is the set itself. For the union also, it was the case. But then comes actually two laws come and these laws involve both union as well as intersection and these laws really do not look this simple. They are called distributive laws. There are two in the text only one has been mentioned but I think somewhere else in the text the other distributive law also has appeared somewhere. Because there are two, so let me just simply call laws. The one that is mentioned here in the text, I mean in this place, is this. A intersection B union C. So you have both the operations. This is A intersection B union A intersection C. 
at first glance it may seem a little complicated it may uh, be complicated to remember where union appears where intersection appears but let me draw the uh, analogy that we saw uh, between the operation of union and the operation of addition among numbers you remember where i mean beside all these similar laws for union we also saw uh, the other similar laws for addition and numbers on this side we had sets and union on that side we had numbers and addition let us now bring multiplication also in the picture say in place of intersection we imagine multiplication and of course in place of a b and c we imagine numbers let me denote multiplication by dot and in place of union we imagine addition do you not remember a law like this you have seen this in your elementary school it is one of the two distributive uh, laws so that will help you remember what you have to write here on the right hand side a dot b in its place here you have a intersection b and in place of a intersection c you have a dot c or a uh, multiply a times c and in the middle you have union here you have plus okay so here also you see that that analogy can be carried forward there is however another distributive law as well where the roles of union and intersection are switched and let me mention that one as well see if we blindly interchange union and intersection let me first write the structure a b c on this side you have a b we are keeping uh, blank spaces for the symbols in place of intersection now we write union in place of union we write intersection so in these two places we should have union and here we should have intersection this is also true for any three sets a b and c and this is the other distributive law in case of numbers there is another distributive law that is however something else okay that is just this where we just uh, switch the order of the product that's not the case here i mean uh, this one does not have a similar law for numbers you cannot you see it will go wrong here if you do the similar thing you uh, switch the roles of addition and multiplication no then it becomes wrong you, you just try to do it okay suppose we write addition here and multiplication here do we have this a plus b dot a plus c you see although we do not write any parenthesis here but there is parenthesis right because we do the multiplication first and then we do addition so that's why i am using parenthesis there however this equation is not always true it's not an identity it may be true for some special values of a b and c some special numbers but not in general so the analogy between this uh, set universe and number universe it's not always there okay for in some situations it's there but you cannot just do everything parallel 
But anyway, these are the basic laws. There are many other laws also. Now in the text, there is a proof of this law using Venn diagram. Let's see that next. Let us first see the proof and then we will uh, have a little discussion about uh, the fact that Venn diagrams actually should not be used for proving any set identity. Okay, so the proof Proof within quotes. It's not legitimate proof. It's just simply a way for us to see, okay, this law should be true. And this proof involves drawing the Venn diagrams for the set on the left hand side and the set on the right hand side. Let us first try to see how the set on the left hand side would look. Keep in mind now you have three sets. Okay. But whether three sets or hundred sets, that universal set of always is there. So for it, that rectangular region is always present. However, in drawing the three sets, we have to be a rather careful. Because these three sets are any three sets, so anything can happen they may intersect one another in any possible way. Because of that, we draw the three sets somewhat in this manner, so that all possible intersections are there. Suppose this one is A, this one represents B, this one represents C. It, uh, try to join this seamlessly, okay, as nicely as possible. Although I myself, I am not able to do that, uh, but you do it on paper. Alright, so what is B union C? B union C, of course, according to how the Venn diagram looks for unions, is this region. Okay, that is B union C. Now, if you take its intersection with A, then you have to take the region that is common to this region, this region, and A, which is this, this thing. Let me just erase the remaining part. So what you are, yeah, of course you are able to do on paper provided you use pencil, but if you use pen, never use pen to draw anything, okay? Always do it with pencil. So this is the region that is A intersection B union C. Now in another diagram, let us try to see this one, the set on the right hand side. So again we have our rectangle, our circles or closed regions, but however you want to draw them. Alright, 
So what is A intersection? Oh, I haven't labeled them. A, B, C. What is A intersection B? The region common to the regions representing A and B. That means this, this one. What is A intersection C? This one. And their union is this, which is the same as this. So it only gives us an, an idea that, okay, these two sets should be the same. However, why, why can we not use this itself as a proof of this identity? Well, one reason is that when we are drawing stuff on a two-dimensional surface, there are many assumptions that we are using from Euclidean geometry. Okay, so that's why many subtleties get involved. And that's why we usually do not accept a geometric proof. I mean, you can prove, but that proof will be unnecessarily difficult due to the fact that you are using the geometry of two-dimensional plane to prove something about set theory. It's unnecessary. Why? Because there are other ways and better ways of proving this. And other ways means, of course, using simple propositional logic. So let us now use that to prove this second one. How can we prove this without using diagrams? That's the question now. You remember what set equality means. What is it that uh, equality of two sets means? What, what is the definition of equality of two sets? We say that two sets are equal. Suppose E and F are two sets. Then they are equal if and only if they consist of exactly the same elements. In other words, each element in one set has to also be in the other set and each element in the other set must also be in the first set. Or in other words, each should be a subset of the other. And when Trying to show that two sets are equal, we actually show these two things generally. Okay. Let us do that for this identity. Assume that in place of E you have this set on the left side and in place of F you have this set. So we are going to take any element in E that means in this set and we will try to show using only logic that that element also belongs to that set. So let us start. Let x be any element. There is of course no need to write in words, let x be any element. You have symbols for that. Use the symbols. A union B intersection C. Now what is that you see? Before you uh, get confused with the how complicated this set looks, try to look at it systematically. After all, what is this set? This set is a union of two sets. One of those sets is A and the other set is within parenthesis. That is B intersection C, but let's forget about that for now. There are two sets whose union uh, contains X. That means either x is in this, or x is in this, or x is in both of them. But because we are using inclusive or, there is no actual need to write in both of them separately. We simply write then, x belongs to A, or x belongs to B intersection C. And then only you see, okay, now here itself you have something else to say. And say then what this one will say. 
Thus, x belongs to A or now x belongs to B intersection C means x will be in B and x will be in C. Okay. Now instead of blindly writing these things, let's just think about it. If x belongs to, now uh, there will be cases, right? If x belongs to A, then x belongs to A union B, of course. Why? Because the union of A and B consists of all the elements of A and all the elements of B and if there is any common element those things also but only once. So if X is already in A of course it will be in A union B and just like that it will also be in A union C. In other words X is in the set A union B and also A union C. So X belongs to A union B intersection A union C. Note that in this case you have actually shown that this general element of this set actually belongs to this set. But this is only one of the cases. What about the other cases? You have to see that also. Now you, you look at this OR case. Either X belongs to A or this situation is true. Or X belongs to B and X belongs to C. This OR case involves two cases simultaneously because there is AND. In this case, Let me keep the identity intact, right? In this case, see x is in B as well as x is in C. Because x is in B, x will belong to A union B again because the union consists of all the sets of A and I mean all the elements of A and all the elements of B. In this case, X belongs to A union B because of this and X belongs to A union C because of this. Do not forget that there is and, so that's why we are able to write and. That is, Again you see that X belongs to both A union B and A union C. So X belongs to their intersection. So in both the possible cases, either this or this, X ends up being an element in A union B intersection A union C. And now only you can say, okay, so does not matter what element I choose in this set, it turns out to be an element in that set, in any case. And that is why every element of this set is also an element of this set. In other words, this set is a subset of this set. Hence, A union B intersection C is a subset of A union B intersection A union C. But you are already dreading something. 
this is only half the job done you have to now show that this is also a subset of that do you have to go through an argument like this no there is a simpler way of actually writing the same thing but a smaller way i mean a briefer way conversely suppose you take any element y in this set but this time we won't write words okay i mean we will write words but it won't be like that this implies what y is in the intersection of two sets this set and this set that means what that means that y belongs to both of them and that's why we write y belongs to a union b and y belongs to a union c there is actually no need to use these parentheses okay now this means if you further break this uh, up why belonging to a union b means what why belongs to a or why belongs to b and again this or is inclusive or and similarly y belongs to a or y belongs to c okay now if in place of this i write y belongs to a or y belongs to b and y belongs to c am i correct we have to justify okay we cannot simply right whatever we want without any justification let let me see all the possibilities see this is true and this is true so both of these things are happening okay it's not that one of them is happening at not the other no this is true this is also true however in both of these two things which are true there are cases because of or suppose y belongs to a then automatically here also y belongs to a now if y belongs to a that's what we have written or something else if y belongs to a this or is true because one of these two things is happening however the second case is that y does not belong to a in that case in order for this or to be true y has to belong to b and because of that same reason y also has to belong to c so that is why y belongs to b and y belongs to c if y does not belong to a then y has to belong to b and y has to belong to c that's why we write and here but now the road is clear because now the things have fallen in place and you can just use the definitions of union and intersection to rewrite this thing in terms of them how let us keep this as it is for now and let's see what we can write uh, in place of this by the definition of intersection you have this and then by the definition of union you have this in this entire argument in all these implications this implication is the most complicated one because in order to figure out this you see i did not tell you what made me write this i simply wrote it and then showed you that okay whatever i wrote it is okay but how did i guess this from where did i guess okay if i write this in place of this then my job will be done actually 
uh, these things come from propositional logic. There are some rules which will allow you to write things like this and you would know what to write after this line. But I am not going to go too deep into those things. The reason is that it's not from an examination point of view, it's not really very important to uh, go through these proofs. I am just showing you because they are there. In the examination, uh, the examiner won't ask you to prove these things in this general form. Okay. So do not worry too much about it. But in any case, you can argue in words like that other part. Okay, you need not go purely symbolically like this. It is done to save space, but again, it uh, creates a little confusion in places like this. But anyway, now in this second part, we have shown that any element in this set is also in that set. So, A union B, intersection A union C is a subset of A union B intersection C. So we have shown that each one of these two sets is a subset of the other. Hence, they are equal. This is how actually set identities are proved logically, not using Venn diagrams. All right. So these are properties of uh, intersection and that last one which involves both union and intersection. And then there is one more uh, operation. Difference, there is not uh, many things about it. So let's see that also. Difference of sets. definition difference of sets is somewhat like difference of numbers that is the subtraction operation somewhat not uh, exactly of course Let A and B be any two sets the difference set A difference B. Well, uh, although this symbol looks like your ordinary subtraction symbol, so you may be tempted to say A minus B, but it's not really a nice thing to say A minus B, say A difference B. In fact, there is another notation for this, to denote this, A backslash B. This symbol is called set minus. It is also used frequently, but in this book we will not use it. And for some reason I do not like this symbol. I uh, like writing this. However, while saying this, do not say A minus B, say A difference B. So that uh, while you are in a very complicated discussion where you have sets as well as numbers, you do not uh, suddenly think that you are subtracting one number from another. If you have, uh, if you develop a habit of saying A minus B, A minus B, maybe at one point you may suddenly think wrongly that A and B are numbers. Always you make it a habit to say A difference B. But anyway, uh, let's now see what the set is. A 
is defined as or uh, let me write in words first is defined to be the set of those elements in a that are not in b symbolically a difference b is the set of all the elements x such that x is in a and x is not in b if you have x belongs to b here that is intersection but this is difference just like intersection here also you have and but the conditions are a little different okay and if you i think by now you uh, can guess uh, pretty accurately what the venn diagram for the difference of two sets will be i should not perhaps say the difference because there are two that you can form just like a difference b you can also consider b difference a that is another one but let's see the venn diagram next again you have your universal set rectangle have you noticed one thing before i draw that have you noticed one thing that when we try to draw the venn diagram for three sets a b and c the diagram actually became somewhat complicated so can you imagine how much more complicated the venn diagram for four sets will be five sets six sets pretty quickly you won't really be able to draw the sets unless you plan everything very carefully that is why we avoid geometric proof in this simple cases for this simple identities which involve only two sets okay maybe a venn diagram can be used to at least see why the identity is roughly true but you may have many sets okay in some pretty involved complicated set identity you may have say five or six sets then proving that with venn diagrams is you will keep on making mistakes you will keep on uh, ignoring cases without you knowing so to avoid those things we follow a logical path to proving these things that is another reason so what this one is saying at is that this is the set of those elements in a which are also not i mean at the same time not in p in other words this time we are strictly avoiding intersection the elements are the elements in a fine so we need not go outside of a but at the same time we are also not considering the elements of b so it is this region it is this region a difference b if you think of the set b difference a it is the set of those elements in b that are not in a it is this set 
I mean in this Venn diagram it is represented by the region shown by this parallel vertical lines that is B difference and in the middle if I put some dots this dotted region is the intersection and just from this diagram you can make one remark that these three sets are mutually disjoint. That's why I define mutual disjointness there. Because if you uh, choose any two of them, there is no element common. In fact, that you can see from the diagram also. Now, before we uh, end our discussion tonight, let us see some examples of this difference. These beginning considerations of set theory are so simple that we may uh, start thinking that set theory itself is very simple. No, it is extremely complicated. In fact, uh, only a part of set theory is used in mathematics. There are some other parts which are purely logical and the complexity lies there. There are many things which are really um, hugely complicated and many things which are still not well understood so that research is going on. But anyway, let's see these examples. Mathematics uses only very small sets. In spite of using infinite sets, those are also very small from a set theoretic point of view. Let A be the set of these integers, these natural numbers and B consists of these sets 2, 4, 6 and 8. Then A difference B. Well, okay, here there you do not have that liberty of choosing B and then seeing which elements are common. No. You have to choose A and C which elements of A also belong to B, you have to remove those elements. It is because of the removal that we call it difference. One, is one there in A? No. I mean in B? No. So one will belong to this difference. Two, two is there, so we cannot take it. Three is not there, so it will be here. Four is there, we won't take it. 5 is not there in B, so we will take 5 in the difference. 6 is there in B, so we won't take it. And that's it. You do not have to worry about 8 because it is anyway not an element of A. Also, you can form the set B difference A. If you go through the elements of B, 2 is there, so avoid it. 4 is there, avoid it. 6 is there, avoid it. 8 is there in B but not in A. So, this. So, A difference B is not equal to B difference A. And in most case, cases, this will be the uh, situation. They are usually different sets. Let us take another one. Let P be the 
state of all vowels in the english alphabet and b be the set of these letters then let me write here a difference b you have to remove these vowels from v because they are they are in v because b has only vowels a i and u and the remaining vowels so that means you will be ignoring a i and u so e and o will form the set a difference b and what about b difference a because v has all the vowels and these are the these are also vowels a i and u so b difference a will be the single term set k consisting of the only consonant k and the section ends here in fact this remark that these steps are mutually disjoint comes after these examples so that's just it for tonight after this we have the usual exercises which we will solve in the uh, community section so see you in the next upload until then this is me lucifer from a mathematical room have a nice day